In order to properly understand the concept of jihad, uh, we need to look at the actual meaning of the word in Arabic. Uh, because contrary to what uh, sometimes presented uh, by certain um, persons within Western academia and the Western media, uh, the word does not itself refer to a holy war or some type of you know, battle or, so, or, or something uh, along those lines. Jihad is an Arabic term. It's translated as exertion, the exertion in the path of Allah, path of God, or the struggle in the path of God. In the West, this term has been misused and misrepresented. Uh, the word inherently in and of itself, it refers to struggle. It means to exert oneself in accomplishing a task and to, uh, to try hard at doing something. There are two types of jihad. One of them is an exterior jihad and the other is an interior jihad. One of the branches of jihad is considered the greater jihad, and the other one is considered the smaller or lesser jihad. So one is of much more importance than the other. In Islam, there has been greater importance put upon the greater jihad. In order to understand these two branches, we need to uh, go back to a story and a specific saying from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Prophet of Islam where he had sent a group of warriors off to fight in a battle and upon their returning he said congratulations you've now completed the smaller jihad or the lesser jihad, the lesser struggle and so they said okay if fighting in a war of self-defense is the lesser jihad then what is the greater jihad, what is the bigger jihad so he said at this point the greater jihad, the greater struggle is your battle or your conflict with yourself, with your soul. What he meant by that was that you are fighting your desires. You are fighting an internal war in your soul and your spirit to perfect yourself, to remove any negative attributes that you have or possess in yourself. Prophet of Islam, Muhammad peace be upon him, has said, the truly powerful person is the one who has conquered himself. This uh, saying of his is a direct reference to uh, this greater jihad, this greater struggle. Uh, and you know, he specifically says, you know, it's, it's, it's of one who has conquered himself, the one who succeeds who conquers himself. And you know, there's a, a narration uh, within Islam where we see that when God created the human soul, He created it with 75 soldiers of goodness and 75 soldiers of evil. So for example, you have a soldier of knowledge and then in the army of goodness. Patience, forbearance, reliance on God, uh, kindness, truthfulness, and on the contrary, you also have the evil army, which is also made up of individuals such as anger, such as a person not being patient, and lying, not relying on God, uh, moving towards the self-inclined towards evil. Tolerance and intolerance, there's anger there and contentment. You know, there's a lot of different uh, uh, you know, attributes of these uh, soldiers that are mentioned. So this Jihad al-Akbar is basically, to, you know, to summarize what it is, it's basically the war within a human being of these, you know, different qualities that we have. And this is something uh, all human beings experience. You know, we all feel this kind of, you know, being torn between two things. You know, there's kind of that godly, good, pious, you know, side of us that wants to go towards towards piety, towards righteousness, towards you know, what is uh, pleasing to God. And then on the other side, there are the, what maybe we could call the satanic elements, you know, of, of things that we want to do. But, you know, there's something in us telling us, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. We have a, a narration that, you know, when you walk towards God, He runs towards you, you know, metaphorically speaking. Or, you know, when you take one step toward God, God takes 10 steps towards you. Okay, so, you know, once a person actually begins to uh, turn to these good forces within him, you know, those forces become stronger and the stronger they become, you know, the less influence the army and soldiers of evil will have over you. And so uh, ultimately that good side becomes dominant and, you know, a human being finds that kind of peace and tranquility within himself and everything he does is according to the dictates of that army of goodness and, you know, the ultimately the army of evil is defeated, it loses its influence, and it's completely tossed aside eventually once one is uh, victorious in uh, Jihad al-Akbar, the greater struggle. 
there are people who claim to be Muslims who use this term in a negative manner. The radical Islamists who fight and kill the innocent, they've used the term jihad to describe their action. And the Western media played a very big role in propagating for the usage of this term in that sense. Now, of course, their, their war or their jihad is not just against infidels or atheists or Christians or Jews. They even believe that killing other Muslims who don't accept their faith or don't believe in their doctrine is also legitimate and compulsory. The Western scholars of Islam and the media outlets that choose to talk about Islam uh, that have a certain socio-political agenda. Um, there are some people that kind of present this concept of jihad as something uh, integral to Islam that was practiced in a way that Islam was spread by the sword. That is, jihad rather than being something uh, where the Muslims are either defending themselves or defending others. Uh, they took it to mean that what happened and what Islam recommends or uh, obligates its members to do is that they convert people by the sword. That is, you go to them, you say, you either become a Muslim or I kill you. In the true Islamic teachings, we don't have anything of such. Islam cannot be spread with sword. Islam is spread through teachings, through peaceful actions, through dialogue, and things of this sort. You know, before I uh, converted to Islam six years ago, uh, obviously, you know, with September 11th and these type of events, um, there was a lot of uh, talk in the media about jihad and uh, what Muslims believe about warfare and attacking other people and these types of issues. Um, and, you know, I, unfortunately, I was direct witness to a lot of, of propaganda. Um, and, you know, at first I, I didn't really know what to think. Uh, because my parents raised me to be someone who is open-minded and who tries to see both sides of every story. And, you know, I knew that, you know, people will sometimes use, you know, take things out of context to serve their own purposes. So I said, okay, let me try to look into this, you know, a little bit deeper. Um, because, you know, I knew some Muslims in my life at the time and they seemed like very peaceful uh, people to me. They didn't you know, when I met them, they didn't seem like they wanted to kill me or they had some type of hostility against me. Um, you know, and every religion has its uh, extremists. You know, whether it's, you know, Timothy McVeigh, you know, blowing up a building in Oklahoma that, you know, uh, destroyed an entire, you know, daycare center of children. You know, he was a Christian. He claimed what he was doing had some connection with Christianity. Or, you know, what happened in Waco, Texas with all of these people committing mass suicide. And, you know, I was able to look at that and say, okay, even though these people are Christians, in no way do I say, okay, this must be what Christianity teaches. Obviously not. So I said, okay, I need to look into this you know, a little bit deeper. And I actually had a teacher in, in high school who um, brought us a lot of these verses of the Quran taken out of context that you know, would just say simply things like, you know, it's your right to kill them. Kill them if you find them. You know, these types of verses. And uh, he would just present them to us alone and he would say, look, Islam is the religion of the sword. Islam is not a religion of peace. So what I did is I looked them up on my own and I found the exact opposite to be the case. The misrepresentation of the term jihad in the Western world is on a very large scale. And this is very unfortunate because the teachings of Islam, the true teachings of Islam, uh, carry within them a message of peace, a message of justice the message of living in harmony with each other, even if they were not Muslims. So just as a, an example um, of, of one of the verses of the Qur'an that's uh, taken out of context and distorted by uh, both the extremists and the uh, people within the media and academia, um, one verse that serves as an example of this is the fifth verse of the ninth surah or chapter of the Qur'an. Um, so what they will typically do is they will quote one specific line from this uh, from this verse which says in the English translation kill the polytheists wherever you find them okay, and they say well it's saying kill them wherever you find them so you know they take this to mean well polytheists must mean non-muslim uh, or sometimes they translate it as infidel which is actually not a proper translation but they say you know this gives the Muslims permission wherever they find someone who's not a Muslim or wherever they find someone who's a polytheist, right away the Muslims have permission to kill them. But this goes against even just the most basic 
uh, laws of academia and just reading a document because this is the fifth uh, verse of the surah. So in order to properly understand it, you will have to read the verses that come before it and the verses that come after it. So when we do that, we see in the very first verse uh, of this chapter of this surah, it says, this is a declaration of repudiation by God and his apostle, which is addressed to the polytheists with whom you had made a treaty. So right here, it's laying a condition. It's not addressed to every polytheist. It's addressed to those polytheists with whom you had made a treaty. And even then, what kind of uh, treaty? A peace treaty. That is, don't attack us, and we won't attack you. Okay, so it's simply that, a peace treaty. So therefore, what this verse is referring to, when it says, kill the polytheists wherever you find them, it's referring to those polytheists that violated that treaty and fought against you. That's all this is referring to, is again, it goes back to that principle of self-defense, that a nation has a right to defend itself against those who attack it aggressively. So this is all that the verse is talking about. And even when we look at the next verse, verse 6 of the ninth surah, it says, If any of the polytheists seeks asylum from you, grant him asylum until he hears the word of God, then convey him to his place of safety. So the fifth verse said, kill the polytheists wherever you find them, when we read it out of context. The very next verse says, if a polytheist comes to you, and this verse is addressed specifically to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then give him asylum, let him hear the Qur'an, let him hear what Islam is about, and then return him to his place of safety, in other words, his homeland. So if the fifth verse is unconditionally saying, kill the polytheists wherever you find them, why in the very next verse is it saying, if someone wants to hear the Qur'an, the Word of God, let him hear it and then let him go back home. If he's a polytheist, he hears it and he leaves to go back home, then surely you should kill him, if that's what the fifth verse is saying. But when you read it in context, you realize that this is talking about a completely different situation.